Misty, would you call the roll, please? <clears throat> David Burris. Present. J.R. Huddleston. Here. Deborah Johnston. Here. Bill Lucan. Here. Larry Pratt. Here. Craig Romy. Present. Linda Varvel. Here. Melanie Wilson. Here. Thank you. Would you join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? <clears throat> As always, Council, remember uh, any potential conflicts of interest, please uh, let the rest of the Council know before a vote. Need a motion to approve an amended agenda. Be adding new business item D. Uh, you have a packet in front of you tonight. Uh, the agenda item would be a possible motion discussion to approve change order number one on the complete concrete contract for the suspended sidewalk. This change order will increase the total contract cost by $21,380.25 to a new contract total of $3,925,981.25. I make a motion to approve an amended agenda to include new business item D, possible motion discussion to approve change order number one on complete con concrete contract for the suspended sidewalk. Change order will increase total contract cost by $21,380.25 to a new contract of $3,925,981.25. Second. Discussion? Uh, this will be also um, attached to the current claims and I'll explain the details of uh, why the change or the yeah the change orders in front of you as well as the invoice for that that new amount during the um, current claims. Any other questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed. The motion passes. Uh, a motion to approve the minutes from the November 21st council meeting. Make a motion to approve the minutes from the November 21st council meeting. Second. Discussion? Uh, I think there's one typo on there on the, uh, br the bridge Minnesota report. Bridge. Uh, it states in there that the Minnacotta Bridge was constructed in 1944, and I think the report actually says it was constructed in 1934. I'll make that correction. Thank you. Any other comments? Any other questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The motion passes. Motion to approve the bills in between. I make a motion to approve the bills in between of $93,014.88. Second. second. Uh, the second, Deborah. Thank Deborah. you. Discussion? I have a problem. And I talked to most of everybody on the council about it. I hate doing this because then it looks so bad. But we have three police officers go to the... This is bills in between? Well, it's payroll. Okay. That's what I'm complaining about. Okay. We have three police officers go to the pier to graduation and got paid for it tune of over $800. One of them got 10 hours overtime for doing it. I have no problems with the police department to go into graduation. I think they ought to do it on their own time or take annual leave or something. I don't think the taxpayers, I mean, we plan to protect the town, drive up and down the streets and stuff, not to drive out the pier and watch graduations. And if I remember right, most of the council that I talked to agreed with me. 
Whether they want to say anything tonight or not, that's up to them. Well, I'll make. I, I think it was absolutely appropriate <laughs> that the chief and the captain supported all the officer at the graduation. So I personally don't have a problem with the chief and the captain going to that graduation and being paid for it. I do, because one of them made 400 and some dollars driving out there and back. Did they take a police car or their private vehicle? Uh, I believe the chief rode with uh, a deputy, and I don't know this for sure, but I'm assuming the captain drove a uh, police vehicle. Uh, don't they have to get uh, approval for travel? If they take a city vehicle? Typically, yes. In the personnel guide, which is right here if anybody wants to read it, it states council's got a vote on that before anybody leaves town. This isn't the first time that that happened. We had other times that people's left town and then we got the next council meeting on there wanting us to agree or not to agree on letting them leave town with the city vehicle. According to personnel guide, it's not supposed to be that way. I think if we have policies and procedures, we probably need to stick to them. I can understand wanting to do this and it's like I'm not against the police force I, when we need them, but we as a council, we have policies and procedures and we need to follow those and enforce those. So Craig, you had mentioned three police officers traveled to the training? Well, two police officers and the secretary. Okay. But they all got to wait for going. One of the issues has been addressed. Okay. Anyone else have any comments? I support our chief and our captain in uh, being there for our officer that is uh, graduating from the academy. Uh, it didn't happen when I was on years ago, and I think it's a great gesture to show support for that officer graduating. Oh, I agree with that. Don't get me wrong on that. I just don't agree with them getting a wage for doing it. Okay, let, let me just say this, that we've all spoken our various opinions, and I think we've got to be careful that uh, we either vote on the bills or and not get into personnel discussions. Mm -hmm. I didn't say any names. No, I know, but we just got to be careful that we don't get into a personnel discussion. Any other comments? We shouldn't discuss them. Any personnel? I um, I also want to support our police, and the, and it is a big deal when someone graduates from the police academy. But I think we need to be careful as to um, what we do put pay out of pocket for for uh, getting there and how many people go and you know we are in a crisis for some budgetary monies right now so um, you know I will be willing to pay these bills but I think we need to look at that going forward in the future anyone else um, well All right. Uh, I want to go on the record saying that I, I support the decision of the captain and the chief to um, go out to the training. Uh, we're trying to rebuild a department. Uh, at the academy, there's a tradition of the, um, the whole class doing 21, 22 push-ups uh, at the end of their, uh, their graduation. Uh, it's a long-standing tradition that's been there. And as soon as the class hit the floor to do their 22 push-ups, the captain was right down there in front of his officer doing the 22 push-ups along with them. It says a heck of a lot. Um, wow. And it's, it's gonna come down to, um, do we support them uh, or don't we? Um, 
and, and I think this was a good thing that the captain and the chief had done. I did uh, mention that the other issue has been addressed. I'm not going to speak to that in public, uh, but it has been addressed. With that, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The motion passes. Uh, motion to approve the uh, current claims. I mayor have to abstain from the current claims. <laughs> I am can, noting can Melanie's abstention. <laughs> I'll make a motion to approve the current claims of $242,905.01. Second. Second. Do you have any questions on them before I um, talk with you about the, the change order and how that relates to the current claims? All right, so the, the change order is directly related to page five of your current claims. And it's the invoice from Complete Concrete uh, for the $21,380.25 that's mentioned in the uh, change order. Change orders traditionally are approved by council prior to the work being done or not being done. Uh, anytime a, a contract is going to either increase or decrease, uh, that change should be brought in front of the council. Uh, for their consideration. <clears throat> this change order came about because of the work related, directly related to the micropiles. Uh, the micropiles uh, are what the support structures for the suspended sidewalk will attach to. There's a total of 26 support structures, uh, three micropiles per structure, so there's 76 micropiles that were drilled. Uh, a micropile is um, three-part construction. Uh, it's a um, large steel tube that has uh, rebar uh, down through the center of it. Uh, and then the final component of that three-part structure is the grout or the cement that's injected into those micropiles. Uh, in drilling of the micropiles, they're pretty confident they know what the length's going to be. Uh, and they know uh, of the micropile and the rebar itself. Uh, what they don't know is how much grout it's going to take to fill, or the, theoretically they know the, how much grout it's going to take to fill that. But what they find is that the micropiles don't always sit on solid ground. Uh, there can be fractures, fissures underneath there. Uh, so they don't know how much grout it's going to take until after uh, they actually inject it. And that's the situation that we had here. So to say that um, the first micro pile that um, may have had some additional grout, uh, they should have stopped and brought a change order to the council. Uh, if that work started on a Tuesday, and they would need to wait two weeks for council to approve that change order. So it was appropriate work for them to go ahead and continue uh, drilling those micro piles. And at the end of it, they looked at how much grout they used, and they used more grout than theoretically uh, the calculations said they should have used. And that grout that was in excess of what was in the pile itself is down in the ground. So that's the reason behind the $21,380. This work was completed late July, early August. Uh, and Tracy and I had had a number of conversations uh, with ISG, the contractor for the suspended sidewalk, uh, but to get ISG complete concrete and then the subcontractor to complete, to uh, all get together and help us understand why there was the additional grout. Uh, took a while to get that done. Uh, the last page in the packet I handed out to you, I highlighted the grouting and the section in the contract that talks about uh, the specially contractable grout the piles, uh, and if there's anything in excess of two times the neat theoretical volume, uh, then they're due to uh, be paid for that additional grout. So that's what this change order is about. So if you're not comfortable in approving the change order, uh, then I would ask you to not approve the claims, because that's where the claim comes from. So typically you would approve the claim, or the change order, then the uh, a contractor would perform the work and the claim would come to you 
uh, weeks later. Uh, this work was done while they were drilling them. They noted, uh, told us that uh, there was additional expenses for grout and they submitted the invoice. So the process uh, as far as approving the contract, change, uh, change order, and paying the invoice uh, would still be the same. It's just the timing of it. The invoice is here at the same time as the uh, change order for the contract. Any questions? All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The motion passes. Motion to approve the Wells Fargo credit card claims. I make a motion to approve the Wells Fargo credit card claims in the amount of $7,528.82. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The motion passes. Communications from the public. Do we have anybody like to address the council? Come on down. Come on down. Come down to the microphone, please. Would you give us your name and address, please? Hello. My name is Forrest Fanning, and I live at uh, 11. 587 Highway 44 in Caputa, and I'm with uh, Dakota Kind Cannabis Company, and we're seeking approval today from you guys, and I would like to answer any questions anybody would have as far as the motion goes. Okay. It's the first motion on our new business agenda, Forrest. So at that time... Um, okay. We'll I didn't know how to go no, about fine. it. I haven't been to yours before. Yep. Thank you. You betcha. Thank you. Anyone else? All right. We'll move on to our council updates. The first council update is Ted Spencer with the State Historic Preservation Office. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of the City Council. Mike up here. Uh, I see you have a long agenda. It looks long to me, so I'll try and keep it fairly short. Uh, I'm the State Historic Preservation Officer. I'm down here from Pierre, and I have our, one of my regional historic preservation specialists, Ms. Liz Almley, with me. And we were asked to address the City Council on our program, uh, some of the financial incentives we have and the economic benefits uh, that uh, historic preservation is provided to the state, especially through heritage tourism. Uh, first off, uh, I've got some materials or handouts, but I'm not sure. <laughs> I can hand them out yeah. for you. Oh, okay. Sir, when you come back to the mic, could you bring the mic? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's like... Can you hear me a little bit better? better? Okay, yes, there, there go. we go. I'm gonna have a pamphlet on certified local governments. It's a National Park Service program. We met earlier with your certified local government. Uh, and that's the Hot Springs Historic Preservation Commission. They met at four o'clock today, and we had a good discussion with those members, including Deb. Help me out, Deb, if I'm saying something I'm not supposed to, okay? Okay, no, you do, keep, keep going. <laughs> Liz, could I ask you your last name, please? My name is Liz Omley. I, I didn't quite catch that or <clears throat> this 
this is a study we did a while back on the economic impacts of historic preservation in South Dakota. It talks about the jobs created, the tax revenues created. Uh, it's not just, oh, it's kind of a nice thing to do to save our historic buildings and historic residents, historic districts. Uh, there's some serious economics behind that and, and why it's a net positive for communities across the state. Uh, and that's what the CLGs or the historic preservations help facilitate is an understanding of why preservation and preserving some of the history uh, through that uh, both architecturally and archaeology, why that's important here throughout the state and our local communities. River Street is quite significant for Hot Springs because you've got those beautiful stand sandstone buildings along River Street, and I know they're hard to maintain, and they can be expensive, and uh, it's been hard to find, I know, tenants and create that tax basis and tax revenue you want from those structures. Uh, they've changed hands. Sometimes you've got absentee landlords. Uh, and, and communities struggle with, with some of that empty building stock and hopefully working with our office and with the local Historic Preservation Commission you can find some economic alternatives and use some of these financial incentive programs that we have as well as the National Trust for Historic Preservation has grants, money, and, and other financial incentive programs uh, to maybe facilitate or make things pencil out for those for-profit type enterprises or businesses that want to take over some of these structures. The big thing uh, for us is we really truly are here to help, especially these smaller communities that have significant history. Uh, Department of Tourism did a study a couple years ago uh, about what's bringing people to the state. And Hot Springs checks a lot of those buttons for, for tourists coming to the state of South Dakota. They want to learn about the Old West. They want to know about geology, archaeology. Those were at the top of the list. Uh, they want to see something unique, something they can't see anywhere else. Well, the mammoth site, Evans Plunge, you know, those are pretty unique. It's not something you're going to find everywhere else. Your architecture here in town is quite significant as well. And you've got a lot of great history with the state veterans home, the state cemetery back behind there. You know, you've got the Spanish-American War, you've got Civil War veterans back there, and then you've got the very first in the nation home for veterans that was here, you know, which is now the current uh, VA center. But that was established for those Civil War veterans, and it was one of the very first ones in the nation. So you've got a lot of things going for you here as a community from a history and heritage tourism standpoint, and I, I just want to express that. Liz has something specific about CLGs. Uh. Thank you for having us. Um, so part of what we talked about earlier with the Historic Preservation Commission uh, were CLG grants that our office gives out. Um, we get a federal grant um, to our office and 10% of that at least has to go out to the local communities. Um, so we award CLG grants. Uh, certified local governments like yourselves can apply for funds. Usually the Preservation Commission applies for the grant and picks the projects, uh, but the money comes through the city. Um, so it, they haven't applied for grants for a number of years, but did in past years, in the early 2000s. Um, so if uh, we spoke to them, our next application deadline is in March. So if they come up with projects um, to apply, they might be speaking um, with the city about that. Um, the grants are paid on reimbursement. Um, so we award the grants in about June. They go through May, and then you apply, um, send us the paperwork for the reimbursement. Um, there is match required um, for the most part, but time of the commission members working on the projects, time that the city staff is spending processing payments, or anything like that can all be included as in-kind match. Um, so we have a number of communities without 
a full-time dedicated staff person who still, um, you know, pick projects that they can accomplish, that they can scale with Match and get everything accomplished. Um, but they can do a lot of um, good research projects, survey of what the historic architecture is, um, find the stories of the historic places and help share those with the community members and find resources for the property owners, um, do workshops about how to take care of the buildings or what programs we run. Um, go attend trainings so they're better informed to communicate with the community. Um, those are the types of projects that the Preservation Commission can apply for our grant. Um, so that's, we're hoping um, that the Hot Springs Preservation Commission finds some projects that they want to apply for um, in this coming cycle, and we hope you'll support them. Um, and we can take questions, I believe. This is wonderful information. I'm gonna make copies of everything and distribute it to them because there weren't enough copies to send out and, to everyone. And most of that is on our website, right. uh, South Dakota Space Shippo, S-H-P-O. Uh, we have the economic studies on there and most of those handouts. Thank you. Thank you. Did you say that the, these are, uh, the grant you were talking about is matching? It, it does require match unless we find some projects that we decide not to require match that year. Um, but yeah, usually a dollar for dollar, but it can be in-kind donated time on the projects as well. And on the projects or on Preservation Commission business generally. Thank you. The, the in-kind's the in important because for smaller communities, if uh, uh, a, a city professional or a city administrator is helping out working on a project that's, you know, uh, for the commission, they can use their their wage basically for the in-kind match, you know, and so that helps facilitate finding the match, you know, use those professional um, pay scales, so to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Ted, you, you were talking about the um, Certified local government grants. Is that something that the Historic Commission on behalf of the City of Hot Springs applies for? So then you'd also talked about, you know, oversight and reimbursements and, and everything, making sure that, you know, the work is being completed. Um, I know you've been with the department a long time, and one of the frustrations uh, for some of us in Hot Springs is that there were uh, preservation grants that had been awarded in the past, and the feeling is that the work never really got accomplished uh, by the individuals that received the grant. Is there a, a change in the oversight, you know, to make sure that even if it's not uh, the city of Hot Springs that applies for it, but some other building owner applies for a grant from you folks, um, that the money is going to really be put to the purpose that they applied the grant for? Um, well, the, the money isn't dispersed until we get invoiced for the work. So in other words, the work has to be done before we make payment. Uh, and that's the same, well, that's for the Deadwood grants for individual applicants. For the city, when they apply saying, we want X amount of money to do these different projects as the Historic Preservation Commission for that CLG program, uh, that's the same thing. Then they say, well, we're gonna do a historic guidebook. We're gonna do a survey. We're gonna contract for a survey, or we're gonna do this or this. Once they've completed it, they'll invoice us and we'll make payment once the work's done. So we won't disperse funds until the work's actually done. That's okay. how the programs work. So oh, go ahead. I was going to say that we can work with the Preservation Commission as they're structuring the application to make sure they're picking projects that are sort of accomplishable. Um, and then if a project doesn't look like it's going to get done, they might have another one to substitute in, and we see those um, changes the scope of work sometimes, and it can accommodate those if they're all allowable projects. So the oversight that's in place now has been in place quite a while, and it, it's not something that's evolving over over time? It's, okay. No. Yeah, the department has encouraged us to have some more um, periodic updates, so now we request updates three times a year of what work's been done and what's been spent. Um, but they're just sort of short fill-in forms just to keep us in communication with that, with the city. 
I know that you worked with the Historic Preservation Committee, but if I as a taxpayer had a particular question, how do I contact either one of you? Uh, yeah, we, uh, public's welcome to contact us anytime. Um, our website is thehistory.sd.gov slash preservation, and we have a contact page with our staff names and the programs that we administer. Uh, yep, there's, the website should be on there, I believe, um, on the funding uh, handout. Um, so yeah, we are reachable by phone or email or fax if you really keen, are keen. <laughs> I have fax, right? <laughs> All right, thank you. Can Anyone in public have questions for him? I have a question. Can projects be city owned, like our city hall building? Uh, actually, we fund a lot of county courthouses, uh, restoration work on those, and it actually helps us because we have a federal match requirement with the federal funds we receive, and usually county courthouses are big projects for work on there, like 100 to 200,000, so all of that goes towards match. Uh, specifically, that would be, the work on the buildings would be the Deadwood Fund grant that was on the one worksheet. Um, the CLG grants can't be used for work on the buildings unless you're teaching a workshop um, for the public or something, um, but could be used for feasibility studies about planning the preservation work that a building or structure might need. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you for coming all the way here. Thank you. Appreciate it. Drive safe going home. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. There's only 34 in town. <laughs> On his side of town. Um, our, our next council update is from uh, our public works engineer, Tracy Bastian. Well, good evening, and it's uh, time for our monthly update of the project. Um, I think it's probably been encouraging for everyone to see um, some lights that are working now. I think that's, uh, uh, we've got the lights down here at the south end of town, and they added some more um, just in the last few days. And of course, we've got some of the lights over there on um, Jennings. Um, the project overall will probably start slowing down um, you know, over the next couple of weeks. Uh, the concrete part of it is just about done. Um, they've got, I think, just a little bit of sidewalk left to do on the west side of um, Chicago Street. And they will uh, probably be taking a break on that part of it. Um, you know, it's just not conducive to be pouring concrete um, as the temperatures get colder and the ground starts to freeze. Uh, the big news right now is the uh, progress on the utilities on North River Street. Um, they completed the section of water main that runs from uh, the Jennings intersection up to um, well, the, the old turnaround spot there by the uh, uh, former uh, Black Hills Energy Building. And today, uh, they were um, kind of had a hard, hard task at hand, but they uh, uh, were working on capping off um, the section of the 16 inch, the one that has given us so many uh, uh, water breaks. Um, so they were capping off the section of that, uh, cutting it off right there at that point, which means that everything from that point on south is you know, no longer that old pipe. I mean, it's uh, on Jennings, it's been removed. This will be removed as they start working towards the uh, storm sewer and the sewer, uh, because the new water main is in a somewhat different location than the old one. Um, tomorrow or Wednesday, they will begin work on the uh, replacement of the clay tile sewer main that uh, parallels that water main on North River Street. Um, you know, we had cameraed this uh, about a year and a half ago, and from the inside, uh, this line looked really to be quite good. Um, today, when they were um, doing this water main cap off, um, there's, I, I guess the thing is, is these 
pipes aren't necessarily perfectly parallel with each other all the way up and down the street. And in that particular location, the sewer main wasn't really very far from the water main. And uh, when they exposed the outside of the pipe, the old sewer main, uh, it's actually in pretty bad shape. So it's you know definitely warranted that we are replacing that sewer main. So that's what they're going to be do doing over the next um, probably two weeks. And what they do past that point, as far as going into the winter, uh, will probably be weather dependent, dependent on their schedule. But at any rate, uh, at the very least, by the conclusion of pretty much 2022, we will have the utilities replaced um, on a portion of North River Street. Uh, so that's pretty much the construction update. Um, any questions? Tracy, is there any plan to go on north on replacing the 16 inch yet this winter well depending on snow load that's going to depend on the weather um i mean my personal standpoint on on, on that obviously is i would hope they do um but um, i know there's some logistics that they have to work out with the DOT and things like that. So we'll probably know a little, little bit more after tomorrow morning's uh, weekly construction meeting update. But at this time, we really don't have a, a firm answer on what their plan will be. And they'll know more after they get this sewer part installed as well. You know, I think it's, you know, this time of year, it's touch and go with the weather. Um, you know, they'll probably have to kind of make that decision once they get to that milestone. Yeah, thanks. Anybody else? So once this part, the sewer line is put in, will they like cover that area with millings for the rest of the winter till they start back up? Yes, that is their plan. Okay. Because the um, suspended sidewalk foundation work is slated to be going on on the other side of the street so they'll have to uh, put the traffic over on the east side at least that's what we've been told is going to happen and all that new pipe will be rebedded fresh bedding so we don't have yes and it was um kind of humorous today uh, talking with the contractor uh, when he was you know when they were digging down to find the old water main he said well on this installation that was done in 1980 they know when they're getting close to the um, water main because that's where all the rocks are at oh. <laughs> that was his quote so uh, the new water main will be bedded is being bedded correctly and with the type of bedding it should have Good. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, for the public's information, uh, Tracy had talked about the construction meetings. Uh, the contractor, Complete, contract, uh, complete Concrete, uh, has public meetings every Tuesday at the um, American Legion at 10 o'clock. Uh, as long as construction is ongoing, and as Tracy said, it's it, it, we're close. We're getting close to the point where it's weather dependent on whether they'll continue uh, construction. But as long as construction is going on, the public's welcome to uh, the 10 o'clock meetings of the American Legion. If you have any questions about uh, the project uh, in its totality, and they're pretty like. A week away of being completely done with the southern part from Detroit on south? It's looking that way. Yeah, and this part over here, it's that part looks to be pretty much done. Uh, they're really just finishing up over on uh, uh, South Chicago Street at this point, uh, tying in some sidewalks. Um, they got the sidewalk down here by the uh, Big Bats intersection, got that put in. I think there's a little bit of dirt work, you know, tidying up. Um, I think that's what they intend to do. Our impression, at least last week, was a couple weeks, and then it'll probably um, become pretty quiet for a while, at least on the major front of the construction. What they've been telling us is once they're done on the east side, the, the west side between University and Baltimore, uh, with the sidewalk and the road, and they're able to open that up, then they'll open that to traffic 
uh, and they'll go ahead and put a uh, asphalt mat over the west side between University and Baltimore to get that to be a more drivable surface and uh, then parking will be available on both sides. I'll open it back up through the winter. And the information we give you today is subject to change tomorrow. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> All right. Anything else? Thank you, Tracy. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Olivia, you're next. Your first one's an update on the chamber? Uh, I'll do the board first because it's the quicker one. Okay. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. All right, well, good evening, uh, Mayor Nelson, City Council members, city personnel, and community members. I have two reports to give. Um, I know you have a long agenda. I'll try and be brief. If I go too quickly, please slow me down. Um, um, I'm here on behalf of the bid board to give a short report. And the bid board met quarterly in 2022, and the last meeting of the year took place on November 8th. Um, at the third quarter meeting in September, the bid finalized their budget for 2023, which had been approved by City Council, based on projected revenue at $100,100. $100. Part of the bid budget is funding the digital media position that's shared with the city and the chamber, a shared billboard at Minicata Junction, firework donations, and balloon festival sponsorships, as well as uh, marketing funds. At the November meeting, the bid also voted and approved funding to wrap another police vehicle. The major portion of the marketing funds are used by the bid to participate in the South Dakota Tourism Peak Season Co-op, which is matching funds from South Dakota Tourism. And this year, the, this year meaning 2023, um, the bid will contribute $55,000 to the campaign, and with a further 10,000 from the chamber, Hot Springs will receive a match from South Dakota Tourism um, to our 65,000. So this will give us, uh, for Hot Springs, a total spend of $130,000 uh, in the peak co-op with South Dakota. So that's excellent money to do an excellent campaign. Generally, um, there's a three-year contract that South Dakota Tourism awards. The last um, agency was Lawrence and Schiller, and their contract expired at the end of this year. So we'll be working with new partners in 2023. South Dakota Tourism sent out RFPs and after reading and scoring all the submissions, seven finalists were chosen to give oral presentations and then the following agencies were selected out of the finalists. They're working with Kosh Hagen out of Denver who will be handling lead creative branding, traditional and digital media and activations. Lou Hammond Group out of Denver will do public relations. 2 by 4 Chicago will do social media, mark, email marketing and website development and we'll primarily work with Love Communications out of Salt Lake City for facilitating the co-op marketing, overall media strategies and consumer highlights. We have already met with Love Communication and South Dakota Tourism, and the following strategy has been devised for the Hot Springs campaign for 2023. The business goals are to increase visitor spending, increase occupancy, increase triple B, now LLD, um, and bid tax revenue, and increase sales tax. Campaign goals are to increase website visitors, increase bookings, um, more guide inquiries and guide requests, and increase media engagement. And the key performance indicators will be booking engine searches, phone calls from websites, text ads, email sends, and guide downloads and requests. So we're very excited to be working with the new partners in the peak season co-op. I think it's a huge boon for Hot Springs, and uh, we will keep you updated on the progress of the campaign, and the next bid meeting will take place in January. So thank you, that was the bid report. Any questions on the bid? If none, I will move straight into the chamber report. 
And staying with tourism, we had a very good year for tourism in 2022. And although we didn't see the high numbers that we saw in 2021, the numbers were very decent and many visitors chose to come to Hot Springs. We participated with our partners at Black Hills and Badlands Tourism Association with a visible presence at their visitor center, a digital presence online, and participation in the BHB Vacation Guide. We were also well represented at all the trade shows that Black Hills Badland attended, where they hand out our Hot Springs brochure. We placed a number of marketing elements in print, such as the double page spread in the South Dakota Vacation Guide, that being the premier publication for South Dakota. We also participated in a direct mail co-op with SD Tourism, where we were present in a mail piece that was sent out to 70,000 targeted homes. We were also featured in a dedicated section of South Dakota Tourism's Travel Smart emails in June and July in a custom partner spotlight. Uh, generally, we follow the same target audiences as South Dakota Tourism, tourism the main states being Colorado, Minnesota, Nebraska, Iowa, Wyoming, and Eastern South Dakota. We had a full page in the very popular Traveler magazine, as well as a full page in Black Hills Visitor. Once again, we collaborated with Custer Hill City Keystone on the Southern Hills Vacation Guide, which was produced by Evergreen Media. We also continued our collaboration with Fall River County Herald Star to create this year's Hot Springs Welcome magazine, which is an excellent publication for marketing our town. Chamber once again sponsored a very successful television co-op with KOTA TV, where the Chamber put up the majority of funds, which it <coughs> pardon me, which enabled local businesses to participate in television advertising. Also, each year the Chamber produces the ubiquitous city map, which is a useful tool for visitors to help navigate to local businesses. To assist with finding a place to eat, we publish a dining guide for visitors' convenience. We also update and publish a two-page laminated quick reference cheat sheet for use by frontline personnel to assist visitors with questions about our attractions, dining, mileage, where to find specific things, where to shop, and other frequently asked questions. We also ran num numerous digital campaigns through Facebook with boosted posts to targeted audiences. These campaigns run through summer and into the shoulder season. During 2020, the Chamber received grant funds for marketing, and part of the grant was spent on creating a promotional video. But this video had to be shot in winter, so the majority of shooting was interiors. This year, the Chamber paid to have the videographer return to Hot Springs and do a lot of the exterior filming to capture the lush greenness of Hot Springs, as well as the great outdoors that we boast. We also took the opportunity to update the video with new businesses, and this is an ongoing project as things do change each year. Yeah. The final edit of the video should be appearing on the Chamber website before the end of the year. We also have different edits of footage for just accommodations, attractions, dining, shopping, and special balloon festival footage. Uh, Depot Information Centre was open from Memorial Day to Labor Day weekends to assist any visitors and locals alike with all things hot springs. The depot distributes the Black Hills maps from Black Hills and Badlands and our own city maps, welcome magazines, South Dakota vacation guides, Southern Hills vacation guides and other promotional literature from local businesses to make visitors aware of everything on offer in hot springs. In May, we planned our annual hospitality and customer service training, but sadly, the day before, our trainer from Black Hills Energy had COVID, so we were unable to get a substitute and had to cancel. Good news is that next year, the Depart Department of Tourism has chosen Hot Springs as the venue to host their annual uh, hospitality training. All in all, we are very proud of our marketing efforts for this year. In other areas, the Chamber has sponsored and hosted numerous events throughout the year. Just to run through the year, I'll give you February, we held the first ever Chili Chili Cook-Off concert, which basically is to pay back the musicians who play for free during the Balloon Festival. And uh, they come and perform on the Mueller Center stage and they take 100% of the door. Just to make things a little more interesting and uh, get people something to eat, we also hold a chili cook-off, which serves as a light meal and a fun event before the show. And we will continue that next year. March saw the annual chamber meeting and awards dinner where we honored various businesses and individuals. 
The dinner was a taste of hot springs, where the meal was catered by local dining and catering members, with each business providing an appetizer, paid for by the chamber, creating a unique meal for our guests and offering the businesses opportunity to showcase their menus. Also in March, we again hosted our annual Southern Hills Job Fair to assist our businesses recruit full and part-time personnel. This year, 16 businesses attended in the hope of finding help, and although we did not see a huge turnout of job seekers, we received feedback that the businesses did find some help, and they hope we'll continue to host the job fair each year. April saw the Chamber sponsoring and organizing the community Easter egg hunt, which took place at the Michael J. Fitzmaurice State Veterans Home, and also in April, Chamber held the Spring Fling Home and Garden Show after a hiatus of two years. In May, on the Memorial Day weekend, our wine walk and putt took place, and this event serves as our unofficial kickoff to peak tourism season. Fourth of July, we held our annual events in collaboration with Rotary, Firecracker Races and City of Hot Springs, and the Chamber sponsored the community picnic and the duck races, as well as sponsoring all the advertising. August saw another huge Hot Springs Chamber of Commerce Fall River Hot Air Balloon Festival, and again there was a great turnout for this event. Also, for the first time, our festival featured shaped balloons in the form of special guest balloons Yoda and Darth Vader. October Merchants Trick or Treat was Hall for Halloween was hugely successful this year with 32 businesses participating and for the first time the Chamber opened the depot and had decorations and trick or treating from there. And um, upside down. November saw the start of our digital advertising campaign, Holiday in Hot Springs, which will run through to the end of this year. Part of the campaign is advertising the Christmas in the Hills celebration and the Cookie Cruise and Storefront Decorating Contest. All that took place this past weekend. Starting on Saturday, December 2nd, as part of the Santa Hat Shopping Spree event, which takes place on December 7th, 17th, the Chamber is sponsoring 12 days of Christmas ads with boosted posts on Facebook. This culminates on Thursday the 15th with a special colour insert in the Herald Star right before the shopping spree on Saturday. Also as part of Holiday in Hot Springs, the Chamber has been sponsoring print, radio and digital ads to attract shoppers to Hot Springs for the holiday season. Also holiday season related, the Chamber has sponsored more than 15 solar lights for the downtown businesses to help light up pedestrian traffic areas for holiday shopping. We're also sponsoring banners and signage to help navigate where to park in the downtown. We understand how difficult it is for businesses during the roadworks and we will support them in any way we can, but we also want to focus on how wonderful our little town will look once the necessary infrastructure and repairs and additions are completed, and that's something to look forward to. So in closing, I am very thrilled to report that we have orders for at least $22,000 in chamber bucks this year. And these bucks can only be spent in hot springs, so that means all these dollars will stay in our local community. Chamber does not make any money off the sale of chamber bucks. In fact, we carry the cost of the printing of checks, bank fees, and maintenance of the accounts. But this is an excellent way to ensure that money is spent at our local businesses. We appreciate everyone who purchases chamber bucks and want to remind people that although they're great for holiday season, they're also available year round. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to update you on the Chamber of Commerce. Please don't hesitate to stop by or uh, ask if you have any questions. Um, I'd like to invite City Council to join us at our annual Chamber Soiree, which takes place on the 20th of December. And uh, just want to take this opportunity to wish everyone a very Merry Christmas and a happy 2023. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. You will send me those copious notes That's because it. I wanted to listen instead of type. Thank That's you. It. <laughs> so, any questions, or I'll scoot out of your way. I have some questions for you. You had mentioned that uh, 2022, um, you didn't see as high of visitor numbers as you did in, in 2021. That it was. Yeah unexpectedly high, my words, not anybody else's. Yeah. Were, uh, is 2022 similar to the 
2020, 2019, 2018. Well, please we're kind never. Of back tw to 2020 does, didn't exist. Um, actually, you're 100% correct. If 2021 was a bumper year because coming off the COVID lockdowns and people not being able to travel, the hills, South Dakota, we saw a huge influx and it was the bumper year on record, as it were. Um, but 2019 was still a very good year and in fact, 2022 has been up from 19. So we're still showing an upward trend. We just didn't, ironically, we did beat um, October was higher than 2021 just by a hair, but it still beat it. But the rest we are higher than 2019. So it's still on an upward trajectory. You'd mentioned the solar lights. Uh, yes. I wanted to thank you for the three that uh, the chamber brought down to help us get through the dark uh, spot there, Super. Uh, where the um, the vault and the uh, China buffet used to be. Um, the lights that uh, we ordered that will be similar to the ones, well, exactly like the ones on the Riverside. They'll be in this Thursday, but uh, yes. those got us through the the cookie cruise. And thank you for doing that. Uh, welcome, and uh, thank you to the city for putting them up because we wouldn't have had a way of doing that. So we appreciate. Uh, working together. Yeah. Uh, I believe it was back in maybe late spring, early summer, we had talked about banners yes. uh, for the new lights. Uh, and it's obvious with these new lights that we're going to need new banners. Uh, the arms themselves are much larger than uh, the poles the, the, that we have on, on existing poles. Um, and the spacing is is taller. So, uh, you had mentioned that you, you thought you might be looking at new banners anyway. Yes. Uh, so I just wanted to give you a heads up that looking at the, the poles that we have now, we're certainly going to need new banners. Yeah, actually what our plans are, um, typically we run a marketing campaign for about three years and then we gauge where it's going to go. So the current Hot Springs picture this campaign will be at its three years at the end of next year. And so once we come up with the new marketing strategy for the following three years, which will coincide with the revitalization of the downtown. We plan to work with uh, Save Our Sandstone, various other groups. We're going to work on the messaging, the uh, having kiosks and signage, complementing what the city's doing, all working together, and basically planning a whole relaunch of the beautiful new downtown when it's done. And banners was one of those things where, um, you know, we need to all get together and raise money for the new Christmas ones. And we'll work with the local businesses to get the, what used to be the soak in banners, whatever the message will be, we'll work with everyone to get the new banners up. Cause they're right. very festive. All right. Thank you. Cool, anyone else? Okay, well, thank you. Merry thank Christmas. You. Thank you. Merry Christmas. So, on to personnel. <coughs> Can I get a motion to approve personnel actions A through E? Make a motion to approve personnel actions A through E. Second. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The motion passes. Uh, on to ordinances. Uh, ordinance A, second reading of Ordinance 1244. Make a motion to approve second reading of Ordinance 1244, Supplemental Appropriation Ordinance. Second. Discussion? Ms. Stewart, would you call the roll, please? Melanie Wilson? Yes. Linda Varvel? Yes. Craig Romy? Yes. Larry Pratt? Yes. David Burris? Yes. J.R. Huddleston? Yes. Deborah Johnston? Yes. Bill Lukens? Yes. Thank you. The motion passes. On to resolution. Uh, resolution A, resolution 2022-25, a resolution authorizing the submission of an application. Make a motion to approve resolution 2022-25, a resolution authorizing the submission of application for the bridge improvement program, BIG, to replace the Minicotta Bridge. Second. Discussion. So, Doug Wetzel talked with us uh, about this at our last meeting. Uh, it's the reason that the uh, resolution is in front of you. 
looking at the three costs that the city would incur with this. Uh, on the first page where the costs are broken down, the city's share, I want to make sure I mention these correctly. Misty, you have a copy of the same email from Doug, so where I misspeak. Yes. The uh, first local match uh, would be $408,000. That's from the, uh, the construction costs. Nope. Uh, it's 20% of the construction costs. The, uh, 168,000, the CE costs. 20% uh, of that would be 33,620. And then the ineligible cost, the 100% local funds, uh, that's 30,240. And then the uh, local match of 408,753,000. Uh, that would come to a total city uh, cost of $472,613.08 would be our share uh, local match uh, of the total cost of the construction of the bridge. Uh, and talking with Doug, he had mentioned that they redid the uh, the numbers uh, that we qualified for, uh, and he said that uh, it looks better that we would be uh, awarded the grant. Uh, our number is now above 50. He had mentioned that we were at uh, 43, 47, uh, and typically uh, they were seeing numbers above 50 uh, would be approved for the grant, and we are now above 50 threshold. Uh, until they award the grant, uh, we don't know, uh, but it looks better that we would be awarded the grant. So again, our matching contribution would be $472,613.08. And where would that come from? We have a couple years to get it, right? Because it wouldn't happen till 2025 at the earliest. Yeah, but if we get this loan, it's going to be for 10 years. I'm talking about two loans. Yeah, yeah two loans. Talking about two loans. Well, we've got a bridge that's overstayed its I, life. I, I agree, Deb. I'm just yeah. saying, where's it going to come from? Well, there's some infrastructure out there somewhere that the state needs to be given us. I'd like to figure out where that's at right now. Don't have an answer for you, Craig. Yeah. Any other questions? We're at 53%. We're at, uh, we're at the point of... It's, it's pretty much a positive thing. Yeah. As far as the can you speak up? Yeah, I can not hear anything. <clears throat> I'm saying looking at <clears throat> looking at the numbers here, we're at fifty-three percent. The city score is at fifty-three point zero six seven. So that puts us above. So it's it's pretty much a good deal as far as that goes. The rest of it on the finances, that's gonna take some work. Any other questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The motion passes. Misty, if you'd let Doug know that <coughs> council's on board, pass the resolution for him. Yeah, I'll have to send him a copy of the resolution. Thank you. Mm -hmm. On to new business item A, a possible motion discussion to approve the cannabis medical dispensary license. I'll make Forest. Oh, sorry. Need the motion first. I make a motion to approve the cannabis medical dispensary establishment license application from Dakota Kine LLC to be located at 1148 Jensen Highway. Second. Forrest, we finally made it back around to you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I do. So we need to be careful here in what we can ask. Um, they have met all of the requirements that the, the state has set forth. Uh, they've met all of the city requirements as far as zoning and those kinds of things. Uh, we, we can't get into the details of what they've done in the business as far as security and those kinds of things. So just putting that out there. 
only question I have is, uh, they have to have a prescription to get this from you guys. I can't hear you. They have to have a prescription to get this from you guys? No. The medical? They, they go to a doctor and they get a recommendation, which is different from a prescription. So it's some kind of card or something they have to show yeah, you? Yeah, they get a card that's issued by the state that says the doctor has recommended them that cannabis will help them. Okay, but you don't have to keep copies of those cards. They just have to show you card every time they buy something. Right, they have to show the card every time they enter our establishment, and the card must be renewed every 12 months. Okay, thank you. Can you only do South Dakota residents, or can others from out of state come in? Uh, with cards? Other states can come and get a card here, but they must see a South Dakota do uh, doctor. Okay, so they can't. I'm not it. a lawyer, but yeah. that's my understanding of it, and. Okay. I know that a couple of radio stations want to interview me about it, so. So they can't bring their card from Colorado and get no. stuff from yours from here. But they can call ahead and talk to the Department of Health, and they can okay their card. Oh. <laughs> and send them a South Dakota card as oh. well. That's my understanding. Do they allow you to give out information on how they go about doing it? No, I can't it recommend doctors or oh, can't no, no, no. be I'm any just part of the process of what they do. Uh, the, the private person coming to you, do you I can't hear you could now the customer comes to you, do you do you have information there if they're ignorant on how the process works? Yeah, you? we have uh, like we can tell them what strain will work best for an illness, but um, is that was that what well, your question? Um, I'm thinking what he's asking if I can try. Go for it. He's asking if I, not knowing your process, if when I come to see you, do you have something you can give me that says you must do this and this and this and this before you may purchase from us? Yes. Okay. So you have available information for the public. Yeah. Um, I'm not as a recommendation, just the process of getting their card or whatever right. it is they need to do. I do know that some doctors plan on coming here and setting up a clinic for Hot Springs. Okay. So that they will be the people to talk to, you know, that the... And, and by law, I can't send them to them at all. So That's I can okay. say I know there's a, a clinic gonna happen at such and such an address. And that's the end of my part in it. So am I understanding you correctly then that residency of South Dakota is not a requirement for a card issued by the state of South Dakota to receive medical cannabis. That is correct. Okay, so at the heart of this, if they don't have that card issued by the state of South Dakota, they're not going to be, uh, you, they can't you, you can't even sell come in. They, they can't even be in the building? No. Okay. They can come, we have like a security wall that's a half wall. They can come in that far, but they cannot go onto the sales floor. So we could talk to them but they cannot come on to the sales floor. All right. Do you have an anticipated opening date? If you guys give us our occupancy permit tonight, we'll be open in two weeks. Okay. I also own a, uh, a grow in a manufacturing facility in Belfouche. Oh, okay. I originally tried to do it here, but I was unsuccessful, so I moved it there. And uh, the first patient that bought from us was from Hot Springs. Now, they didn't buy from us. They bought from a dispensary in Rapid City, but they drove to Rapid City and waited for 45 minutes for them to 
open their doors. And I went to the, their grand opening because it was my product. So, and I know that in this county that 67% of the people voted for medical marijuana. So a two to one ratio of for and against. That's why I came here. I didn't want to be in the Rapid City market where 15 people are dividing up every 5,000 customers. I mean, I have less here, but there's a large surrounding area that you service that I seen as very attractive. Okay. okay. Any other questions? You mentioned the permit, but Scott already issued that, correct? So this council is addressing the license tonight. I guess. Yes. Is that yes. Okay. They've done a lot of the groundwork because okay. I'm at the grow and the manufacturing facility, so. This Paul and Erica are my partners here. All right, any other questions? It's all new, so I don't know what to ask in a lot of a lot of ways. To be honest. All right. Uh, it, I do have one question, I'm sorry. That's fine. Do you, now when you buy it, uh, how, did, uh, how does that little process work there? You, you put it on a scale or something? Or, I mean, what? Uh, we haven't decided whether to do a la carte or prepackaged. I'm kind of leaning towards prepackaged. So if you come in and say you have bursitis, and I would tell you that Blue Dream is really good for treating that pain then um, you could buy an eighth of an ounce, a quarter of an ounce, a half ounce, or up to three ounces of that product. And so then we'd give it to you in a package. And then that package has to be in another package and has to be stapled shut. And then you walk out with your product and go home and use it. But not only will we be selling uh, flour, we'll be selling edibles and um, so people that don't want to smoke it, it's a, a better delivery system for people with lung problems and things like that. And it has less stigma to eat a gummy than smoke a joint. Will this be taxed? Huh? Will this be product be taxed? Uh, like yes. sales tax? It has the six and a half percent tax, and that's it. Recreational will go more, and I believe you'll receive two percent of that. Okay. I'm sure there's someone up there that can correct me if I'm wrong, but that's my understanding. Okay. Yeah, she could. Two percent is correct. <laughs> so, can they? walk out of your building and use it legally right there or no anywhere else in town or they can't use it on our premises uh beyond that i can't speak to like an edible i i don't know how you would limit that that at all any more questions We're done. Forrest, thank you. We just have to finish voting. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Right. Misty, would you call the roll, please? Deborah Johnston? Yes. Bill Lukens? Yes. Larry Pratt? Yes. Craig Romy? Yes. David Burris? Yes. J.R. Huddleston? Yes. Melanie Wilson? Yes. Linda Varvel? Yes. Thank you and congratulations. 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 Good luck. Congratulations. Hope you do well. Do well for us. <laughs> we need the money. <laughs> <clears throat> On to new business item B, a possible motion discussion to approve change in the account signature card. Make a motion to approve changing the account signature card at Wells Fargo to remove resigning assistant finance officer Karen Bingley and replacing with 
Ariel Bachman. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The motion passes. New business item C, a possible motion to discussion to approve travel training request. I make a motion to discuss to approve a travel training request from water maintenance operators, Tad Harder and Pete Miles, to attend the operator certification exams for wastewater treatment one and wastewater collection two certifications on December 8th, 2022 in Rapid City, South Dakota. Second. Thank you. Discussion. Are they gonna actually work down there part-time to help us out until we find people? They already are. Do you know that for sure? They smell like sewer. Oh, okay. I guess they are. <laughs> I, I'm just, you know, I know we made a deal years ago that every license you get, you get an extra dollar an hour raise. I don't know if they're doing it just for the money or to, up, to help their education. I'm hoping it's the education part. I, I would like to, like to say it's it's uh, purely uh, because they want to work in the sewer department, but I would say it's probably both. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing that, that bothers me is they're over on their budget for travel. Oh, we need certifications in that. Well, we already have quite a few. Evidently, they have the class one in distribution. And I know Sean Hiley's got one and two and all of them. I'm not against them getting them, but. They will ride together. Uh, the expenses for the class will be paid by the attendees, $60 a piece. I um, miss, did that last time and they did pay us back. Um, so the 240 for exams, for the four exams, they'll pay that themselves. That won't come through the city. Up to $64 per meal, that's $14 each for three days. Probably won't eat all those meals and they will drive together in a city vehicle. And they're not staying in a motel? I, I think they're coming back and forth. I think they're driving back and forth. And, and you know, in all fairness too, this is something that we, we are recommending they do because we're trying to cover the, the, the shortages down there. So we, we, yeah, we press like, them into this a little bit. Like I said, I have no problems with that. Yeah. I just know that, you know, the budget kind of short on it. Okay. Any more questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The motion passes. Um, New business item D, a possible motion to discussion to approve change order number one. Make a motion to approve change order number one on the complete concrete contract for the suspended sidewalk. This change order will increase the total contract cost by $21,380.25 to a new contract total of $3,925,981.25. Second. <laughs> Discussion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <clears throat> The motion passes on to committee reports. Uh, admin and finance, JR, yes, Melanie. Admin finance met today at one o'clock here at the Mueller Civic Center. Uh, in attendance were Mayor Bob Nelson, Misty Summers Walton, Jeff Temple, Tracy Bastian, Alderman Deb Con Johnston, co-chair Melanie Wilson and chair JR Huddleston. Old business, item one, discuss selling land. The city owns adjacent to the Simon Quarry Cemetery and Hot Brook Canyon Pump Station, uh, five acres landlocked Simon Quarry, seven to nine acres north of Hayden's, and over 100 acres behind the pump station. Tracy advised the property landlocked with Simon Quarry and the cemetery is approximately 18.18 acres, uh, not five acres. Tracy also stated the land that was a, that was uh, the old county building land had been purchased and provided us a document showing a portion of the property, less than a thousand square feet, was formerly a railroad right of way given to the city and is owned by the city. Purchaser wants to buy this small section from the city. The committee recommends to surplus the 18.1 acres landlocked with the cemetery in Simon Quarry 
and the small section discussed at the corner of the Old County Shop property along Garden Street. Item number two, additional costs related to wastewater treatment, water and wastewater treatment, damn, replacement road project, ongoing review and discussion necessary. Applied for a state highway fund loan of, of approximately uh, 1967000 Transportation costs as previously provided by MISTI. Number three, gauge installation at the city shop propane tank installation should happen this week. Clothing allowance policy, PD utilities and maintenance. It's under review, it's ongoing. I still have to meet with Jeff. New business, uh, review monthly finance reports. Misty provided an overview. Number two, city attorney rate increase. Attorneys raised this rate by $10 an hour. Small claims, halt homes, awaiting city attorney review of those documents. State highway fund loan application updates. Application submitted. Committee member items, the mayor provided a change order from complete concrete in reference to work already done in July on the suspended sidewalk project. Additional agenda item for tonight's city council meeting. Tracy spoke on the South Dakota PFAS cost recovery program. The meeting adjourned at 2 p.m. Next meeting January 3rd at 1 p.m. Mueller Civic Center, JR Chair. Melanie? <laughs> Any questions for JR or Melanie? What did you guys decide on another two pieces of property? We're going to take one at a time right now. We're going to. But you said two tonight. Well, I know. That's because that's. It was last minute on one. But we're going to try to take one at a time and do those so that we can get uh, good information before we go forward and we're not rushing into anything or make sure we do it right. Good idea. Any other questions? Thank you, JR. Melanie? Airport Advisory, Bill? Airport Advisory met on Thursday, December 1st at 8.30 a.m. at the Hot Springs Airport. Members present were Shane Miller, Gary Telkamp, Mark Boxbaum, and Petra Wilson. Employees present were Rick Breitenbach and Tracy Bastian. Elected officials present were myself and Mayor Nelson. Now, there were no members of the public. Uh, airport manager update uh, regarding the T-hanger, the change order approved by council at the November 21st meeting was reviewed with the committee. Monthly fuel sales for November, uh, we sold 500 gallons of aviation fuel. We had 35 flight operations, two balloon launches and no landings. Hangar utilization, the city hangar is 110% utilized and the old hangar is 100% utilized. We had no old business. Under new business, we welcome new member Gary Telkamp. We reviewed the airport advisory committee charter. Uh, the airport manager made the committee aware of a South Dakota DOT PowerPoint presentation on airport operations. Uh, items from the members. We reviewed uh, the recent snow removal efforts and the associated notams that uh, were put out by the airport manager. Our next meeting will be Thursday, January 5th, 8 a.m. at the airport. Meeting adjourned at 9, 10 a.m. Any questions for Bill? Thank you, Bill. Custer Fall River Regional Waste Management, Management Larry. The meeting started at 7.03 p.m. Present were Mike Lindy, Dean <coughs> Weekly, Les Cope, Dan Frieden, myself, Carl Shaw. Absent were Peg Ryan, D. Anderson, and Joe Messinio. Carl Shaw was appointed by City of Edgemont to replace Roger Horton. <coughs> Treasurer's report was given and approved. Motion was made to transfer $250,000 <coughs> from First Interstate op Operating Account to First National Insured Cash Sweep Account. Credit card fees were reviewed, no changes were made. Dennis Tubb attended the meeting on behalf of Kerry Barker. Landfill operations are going well and all equipment is operational. Jason Hines from FMG presented the permit renewal application. The application was approved and Chairman Lindy was authorized to sign <coughs> said application. FMG will su submit the application by November 27, 2022. 
the 2023 preliminary budget was discussed. The final 2023 budget will be discussed for approval at the next meeting. The 2021 audit requirements for the district were re reviewed by board members. <clears throat> the district will be looking for a new auditor. The previous auditor will no longer be providing services <coughs> for the district. Outreach to solicit RFPs will continue. No public comment. The 2023 meeting will be continued to be set for 7 p.m. on the second Thursday of every other month. Next meeting will be January 12, 2023 at 7 p.m. at the Miller Center. <clears throat> meeting adjourned at 8.09 p.m. Can you clarify what the application was for for FN, FN, the FNG submitted? I didn't catch that. The permit renewal application. Permit renewal application, yes. thank you. Any other questions for Larry? Thank you, Larry. Yes. Historic preservation, Deborah? Um, our meeting for this Wednesday was changed to this afternoon um, because of the uh, people coming from here today, um, Mr. Spencer and, um, and Ms. Omley. So we met today at 4 p.m. here at the Mueller Center. And so I don't really have minutes. Um, there was one application for certificate of appropriateness um, asking to change the signage on Misty River to rename the business the Smokehouse Sports Bar, Bar, Sports Bar and Grill. The Smokehouse Sports Bar and Grill. And that was approved. So, um, and then we met with Mr. Spencer and Ms. Omley, and they gave us the information that you got tonight as well. Um, our next meeting will be January 4th, Wednesday, 5 p.m., here at the Mueller Center. Any questions for Deborah? Thank you, Deborah. Evans Plunge Advisory, Linda. Our next meeting will be Thursday, December 8th at noon. Thank you. Parks Recreation, uh, Larry. The, <coughs> this is a previous meeting. I've been kind of sick a couple of times, so bear with me here. <laughs> this particular meeting started at 2 p.m. Present were Gerald Colligan, Jeff <coughs> Ali, Linda Varvel, Bark C, Chris Katke, Kathy Crenn called in, and myself. No cemetery update. On the rec update, Miller Center still had three activities going. Things have slowed down. On the parks update, sprinklers and bath <coughs> rooms, repairs, cutting trees, helping with the street project. On a new business, the Brookside Grill has been installed. ADA ramp by music stage at Centennial Park on hold due to the road project. The 220 outlet at Centennial Park, Wilson Electric, Electric will do the project. Challenge Dakota State for Preservation Committee welcome new committee chair Jeff Alley. <clears throat> Wants to keep the project going for safer use to general public. In old business, cracks at tennis court, pickleball have been filled in. Volunteers did an excellent job. On public comment, a member of the public has some concerns about the parks, was informed that the issues would be discussed with city administrator. The meeting, data meeting adjourned at 2.30 p.m. Next meeting was scheduled for November 2nd. Committee members were out helping with road project and various duties with parks getting ready for winter. Next meeting will be December 7th at 2 p.m. at the Mueller Center. Any questions for Larry? Thank you, Larry. You're welcome. Planning and zoning, Deborah. The next meeting is um, December 21st. Wednesday at 6 p.m. City Hall. Thank you. Public safety, Bill, Jr. Public safety met Thursday, December 1st, 2 p.m. here at the Mueller Center. Present were myself, Jr. and Deb, uh, the mayor, Chief Norton. Members of the public were Frida Huddleston, Jane Lukens, and Aletha Nelson. Uh, there were no communications from the public. Update from the police department. Uh, we thought we had an applicant that would fill our last open position, but uh, they withdrew their application at the last minute because of, uh, um, it was actually a sheriff's deputy, and the sheriff that he worked for had a 
an injury which would have left the county without law enforcement so uh, the deputy decided to stay on for a while so we're still generating applicants so uh, under old business uh, we had no update on the ICS training for the uh, council no update on the fuels reduction grant or the traffic signs or, or uh, the junk abandoned and junk car draft ordinance on the speed camera project update an update was provided based on information received from a phone call with a prospective vendor uh, we will continue to pursue the project under new business uh, we discussed opportunities to introduce the uh, individual police officers to the community uh, we, uh, one of the members reported that there had been some concrete dumping on Washington between 23rd and 24th. Uh, this is a potential nuisance ordinance violation and the information will be forwarded on to the city administrator and the development coordinator. Uh, we discussed blocked sidewalk issues at uh, around the Wandering Bison establishment at University and Chicago Street and the development coordinator and the PD are addressing the issue with the property owner. Our next meeting will be Thursday, January 5th, 2 p.m. here at the Mueller Center, and the meeting adjourned at 2.34 p.m. JR, anything? Nothing. Any questions? Thank you, gentlemen. Public Works, Dave, Craig. November 29th. 1 p.m. here at the Mueller Center. Those in uh, attendance, Mayor Bob Nelson, Engineer Tracy Bastian, uh, Craig Romy, Deb Johnston, and myself. Uh, new business, discussing uh, repairs to the stairs. Uh, we're, we're, looking, we're looking around June is where we'll probably start that with the idea of manpower and time. Street maintenance, uh, trimming trees in the alleys and stuff will proceed at, just like I said earlier, uh, with manpower and time. Uh, we, are, we are a little behind on some of our projects, but we'll get where we need to be. The icy spot at Vision Source, Albany. Um, there again, um, it's on the schedule but we're still looking at manpower and time. Um, we discussed the ADA ramp near uh, Massa Dental. Um, I did not catch a time on that. No, this would be great. Did you? I think they're done with it. It's all done. The street isn't open yet, but okay. that side of the street, I went and worked out this morning. It looked like it had concrete done to it. So. Okay, I wasn't sure if that was going to get done this well, it's the north side of the street isn't done yet. Yeah, so it's not usable as of yet. Um, irrigation around a depot building, um, the, the two little park areas, uh, that's kind of, we're still looking into that, but it's probably, probably going to be on hold for a bit. Sons of the American Legion, their flagpole in Centennial Park, that has been, the pole's been pulled, but we're not set for putting in the new one yet. Is that correct? We're still at that point. No, the pole hasn't been pulled, um, but it's waiting on. The bolt broke when they time. tried to pull. Oh, that's yeah. correct. That's yeah. correct. Put that on my notebook and not on this. Okay. My my bad. Um, Bear Avenue propane tank. We're gonna go ahead and scratch that off the list because we don't see where there's we have any place to say anything there privately owned property. We don't see a hazard at this point in time. Um, there is things that uh, the property owner could do if, uh, if he wishes to proceed with that. Uh, utilities, pretty much Tracy already touched on what I had. Code enforcement, um, they all just touched on that. And uh, discussion on lease and royalty agreement with uh, Simon's materials, still putting together information on that. 
Um, our next meeting will be December 13th, 1 p.m. here at the Mueller Center. Everybody's always welcome to attend. Correct. You got anything? Just the lights on Bear Avenue. We're going to scratch that off there, too. Okay. I didn't hear that one. And also, the icy spot on Albany is being taken care of with the construction that we added. Um, Supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so that's being dealt with with complete concrete with the intersection there. Okay. That intersection on Baltimore. Right. That's it. That's what we got. Any questions for Dave or Craig? Uh, Dave, you said you're going to work with availability of staffing they're going to work the stairs yes that's going to be in billy at this time is is looking at how is that in conjunction with the stair climb we do and um yeah well that's that's in uh, in the figuring of the schedule so he wants to get that done and let it set up before he, before that gets there so okay so that is on the schedule with that with that event dave that individual I mentioned for the uh, stair climb, I did reference him, you, and Craig for that with Public Works. If he had any questions there, okay. just let you know. All right, thank you. Thanks, Dave. Yep. Anyone else? Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Southern Hills Golf Course, I believe last time they're on a hiatus until the golf season comes back. That's affirmative. <laughs> so that brings us to our city administrator report. The only thing I would add to committee reports, uh, Bill, unless you did it while I snuck out, was the uh, final proceed amount on the, uh, uh, or JR, I'm sorry, I guess it was your report, I apologize, on the uh, pro the uh, surplus auction, which was 11665 was the proceeds back to the city uh, on that. So that's all I've got, subject to your questions. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jeff. Misty, finance officer report. It's going to be long after that. <laughs> <laughs> Provided you the monthly finance officer report with the financials through the end of November, our year-to-date profit and loss summary, our fund summary report, our budget versus actual numbers on that report don't look that great, but you did approve the second reading of the supplemental appropriation ordinance at this meeting, so I will update that after 20 days. Uh, the cash balance report that shows the current cash balance in our main Wells Fargo checking account by fund and the investment report, which shows that we do have one final CD that's maturing February 19th, 2023 at First Interstate Bank. It is a wastewater debt service reserve fund CD, um, currently earning a very low percentage rate, and so I'll be looking at opportunities to raise the interest, but we will be keeping those dollars restricted for the debt service that it supports. As we prepare to finalize and wrap up 2022, there's an expectation that department purchases will be restricted to emergencies only after the last claim batch of the year is paid at your next meeting. As claim reviewers and approvers, you can expect to see payments of 2022 payables for at least the first month of 2023. Those are expected within 30 days, but historically extend a bit further. We also collect many 2022 receivables, which is revenue in the first month or two of 2023. The city's a modified accrual basis of accounting, which is applied to all our governmental funds and a full accrual basis for our enterprise activities. These standards require that we recognize both revenue and expenditures in the year in which the object or service was received or obtained, not when it's paid for. That's cash basis and it's a lot easier. In the finance office, we also post a number of journal entries required to recognize the effects of payables, receivables, and accruals for financial transactions like payroll, leave liability, loans, special assessments, inventory, and other various items. When these are done, this provides users our of, a, of our financial statement a snapshot of the city's financial position as of the end of the year. It certainly takes a team effort, I have asked all department heads and purchasers to support and assist us with timely reporting. 
During the second meeting of December, you typically approve the annual subsidy transfer from the 212 additional sales tax fund to both Evans Plunge and Southern Hills Golf Course that you budget for each year. Each fund has two sides to its budget, uh, the revenue and cash applied, and then the appropriations or expenditures and transfers out. To fulfill the requirement to pass a balanced budget for 2022, we projected both funds would require additional means of finance or transfers in. The estimated amounts were $177,344 for the golf course and $176,360 for Evans Plunge. At the end of the year, only the amounts necessary to cover actual expenses and to ensure a positive cash balance is transferred. This year, both funds are on track to not need any of their subsidy. This is a big accomplishment for both funds and took an entire year's worth of work and excellent management to get here. So I'd like to give kudos once again to both the golf course and the plunge on the accomplishment. I did, um, forget to subtract the November payment to the Evans Plunge bond issue. Uh, it was a 127,000 that may require Evans Plunge to have a small subsidy, but I do have the insurance money for the hail damage from the June storm that I will be depositing um, this week into that fund and so if they don't exceed their expenses significantly, they should not need a transfer. I'll give you an update on our contribution, investment, and administrative fee rate notice for 2023 from the South Dakota Department of Labor and Regulation for our re-employment insurance, previously called unemployment. The rate remained the same uh, from 2022 to 2023 at 0.87%. Those fees are charged to the first 15,000 of wages earned by all of our employees. The rates based on the length of time we've been an employer, our past taxable payroll, and past charges and credits to our experience rating account. As you can imagine, the pandemic impact impacted this rate significantly, and we are hoping to see it trend downward again by 2024. I started the rough drafts of the required first of the year resolutions, which will include the designation of banking institutions, the designation of our official legal newspaper, and the wage scale resolutions. I'm planning no changes to banking institutions or the official newspaper. The council approved COLA increases of 50 cents for all full-time benefit employees and the state minimum wage increase of 85 cents for part-time positions will be implemented for all employees. Please let me know if you have any input on these resolutions. Um, JR mentioned in his update that our city attorney has indicated he plans to raise his hourly fee for, for legal services from 140 to 150 an hour. That will be effective January 1, 2023. I believe this is the first increase since you became our primary city attorney. Second. Um, I've decided to hold off on interviewing and hiring for our open administrative assistant position at City Hall until sometime early next year. With the holiday seasons, employee time off, and our other staffing change and training, I've decided it wouldn't be beneficial to move forward at this time, as I'm not able to manage setting up and appropriately training a new hire as well as training and observing our new AFO. The city's an excellent place to work, and I remain committed to filling the position eventually. I just don't want to rush into it and not give them the time and attention that they'll deserve. Um, on that note, I'd like to thank those of you who came to Karen's farewell party on Friday. I did receive notice today that she's arrived safely in Missouri and her back hurts from moving all the stuff into her new house. <laughs> Uh, as a reminder, I'll be out of the office on Wednesday of this week to attend the Black Hills Area Finance Officers Association quarterly meeting in Somerset. I'm excited to meet with peers to discuss topics like our assignments on SDML policy committees. I serve on the General Government Policy Committee. The recent SDML annual conference, which we purchased the virtual version for the first time. I'm excited to talk to other finance officers who had done that. We're talking about legislative ideas and concerns. Um, the finance officer school planning for 2023, upcoming training opportunities, including the election school webinars, which occurred December through March, and the annual report workshop in January. 
and my favorite part of each meeting, the city roundtable discussions. I thank you for allowing me the opportunity to be part of this group and to travel to attend meetings in person as they're very valuable. Um, Jeff gave an update on the Bradeen auction check we received. There were $3,377.50 of Wesh Oak items that were sold at this auction. I'll need to get with our city attorney to update um, the amount that they owe us. My understanding was we were to subtract that from the debt owed to the city once those items were sold. So I'll work with you, Garland, to get that done. And then I also received the $1,485,594.57 ACV check from Claims Associates related to the June 13th, 2022 hail damage to the buildings. And reminder, we still need to determine what we fix and determine and report to SDPAA what we will be fixing. As this year comes to a close, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for what you do for our city. The work that you do is invaluable and you certainly don't get paid enough or receive near enough praise for all the work that you put in. I appreciate each of you and I want you to know that it's both an honor and a privilege to work with you for the city of Hot Springs and the betterment of our community and I look forward to another year of doing it in 2023. Thank you. Any questions for Misty? I have a question. Yes. You mentioned something about putting insurance money in Evans Plunge budget from hail damage? Well, they have a large a large portion of that check is related to their damage, but yes. Their whole roof needs replaced, right? So we're not going to use that. We haven't gotten there yet. Yeah. We haven't yeah. made that decision yet. Yeah, it'll just be cash in their fund, though. So it will prohibit, it will make it so that they don't end the year with a negative cash balance. You may have to help them next year if the entire roof is replaced, and that's a decision future council will make. Any other questions for Misty? It's not specifically a question for Misty, but uh, the conversation about hail uh, brings up that um, it was about a month ago, Craig had asked to have that brought back to public works uh, so that Larry and Jeff could explain their reasoning behind the recommendations they made as far as the repairs. And then Larry uh, and um, Dave were also going to talk about that. So the next public work works meeting is <coughs> December 13th, if I'm looking at the calendar correctly. Yes. So if uh, Jeff uh, and Larry uh, in particular, if you could make that meeting uh, so that Dave and Craig can ask you the questions uh, that they still have on their minds as far as uh, the recommendations that you have for repairs and non-repairs, that would be helpful. Uh, I don't have a report for you this evening, so that brings us to our executive session. Uh, can I get a motion to go into executive session? Make a motion we go into executive session in accordance with South Dakota codified law 1-25-23 legal. Second. Discussion? Uh, I expect that this won't be a long executive session. Uh, we won't have any uh, business when we come out of executive session. And uh, Misty, Jeff, and Garland, if you could join us. Uh, we have a couple items that I'd uh, like to brief the council on. Can we so, take a short break before we? It may need to be more than a short break. Okay. But, uh, <laughs> all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes, uh, and there will be a break. We have all the council here at 9.31. Looks like our attorney and city administrator have other business they're discussing, but um, can I get a uh, motion to adjourn? I make a motion to adjourn. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Have a good evening, everyone. Bye, Laura. Good evening. Bye,